This video is made possible by donations to the United States Lighthouse Society from people like you. Welcome everyone. It's good to see so many familiar faces and we want to thank you for being a part of the very first Friends of Flying Santa virtual gala. Uh, I'm Jeremy Dontremont. Some of you might know me as the, uh, the host of the U.S. Lighthouse Society podcast, Lighthearted. And today I'm wearing my Flying Santa hat as Vice President of Friends of Flying Santa, also wearing my U.S. Lighthouse Society hat. This event is co-sponsored by the Society. Some of you may have attended Friends of Flying Santa dinners at the Coast Guard Station in Boston, or maybe you've come to one or more of our cruises. We've done many cruises over the years, also some bus tours. We sincerely appreciate your support. We hope to see you at live events in the future. For those of you who are unfamiliar with uh, the Flying Santa and its connection to lighthouses, I'll just start by telling you it's a wonderful tradition that started in 1929. It's still very much alive today. It started mostly as a way to show gratitude to lighthouse keepers and their families. And today it's mainly a way of showing appreciation to Coast Guard personnel and their families. In a few minutes, I will give a presentation on Flying Santa history. That'll fill in some of the details. And you can also learn more about the history at flyingsanta.org. The website has a lot of history and a lot of old photos, old and recent photos. This event is co-sponsored by the US Lighthouse Society. And at this point, I'd like to introduce my friend, Jeff Gales, who is the executive, executive director of the society. Uh, glad you could be here tonight, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm good. Thanks, Jeremy. Appreciate you doing this on a Saturday. And uh, we're really excited to partner with the Friends of Flying Santa. It's a great organization, and we're happy to do this. Um, I just wanted to tell everybody that you know, being at the holiday season, uh, we are now in, our, in the midst of our ornament uh, uh, fundraiser, so we're featuring the Pointer in a Lighthouse. You can order that on our website if you want to pick up one. And then uh, next month, uh, December, we'll be uh, launching our annual Lighthouse Vacation Rental Auction, which is always hugely successful and um, usually attracts more than half a million unique visitors to the uh, to the society and our website. So we're excited to promote that, but I don't wanna take the, uh, uh, the wind out of the sails from the uh, Flying Santa. I wanna feature that this time. So let's go ahead and uh, move forward with the, uh, the program. Well, thank you very okay. much, Jeff. We'll talk to you again in a little while. Uh, Next, I would like to introduce the president of Friends of Flying Santa. I've known Brian Tagg for somewhere around 25 years, give or take a, a few decades. Uh, and I can tell you it would be impossible for anyone to work harder than Brian does starting around September and going right through the holidays. There's more work than you can imagine that goes on behind the scenes to make these yearly flights a reality. So Brian, how you doing? I'm doing well, Jeremy. Okay, 
I know it's a busy time of year for you. So how are this year's flights shaping up? Uh, they're shaping up pretty well. Um, we've uh, done pretty well with our fundraising. Um, always can use more, but uh, we've got enough to uh, you know, at least get us underway for our first few flights. Um, but we've got most of our uh, toys packed up and ready to go for the main New Hampshire flight coming up on the 28th. And um, other than that, we're just working around the clock to make sure all the logistics are falling into place. Okay, so uh, I know this year is a little different for everybody. How are the flights different this year, the Flying Santa visits? Uh, we've got a, a lot of COVID restrictions that we have to be aware of. Um, it's going to be more of a drive up procedure. So we'll land the helicopter and get out and uh, Santa will stand at the end of the six foot table and the families will drive by in their vehicles and a crew member will hand off a bag of toys uh, and gifts for the family. And, uh, you know, they'll be able to chat and see Santa, but there'll be no sitting on the lap and um, you know, family pictures with Santa, but uh, it's just for this year. Things will be back to normal next year. Right. Well, it's still a thrill for the kids to see the helicopter coming in with, with Santa and to, to see Santa in the flesh. Yeah. Absolutely. The families were wondering if we'd be able to do it this year and they're thrilled that the flying Santa traditions is going to continue. We're 91 years. We, we have to keep it going. Yeah. And that's great. So what are the toys this year? Uh, toys, we've got a mix of, uh, we've got our, our annual uh, stuffed animal that we get. This year is going to be a mountain goat. Um, we've got some helicopters, some flip cars, some uh, puppies that sing and uh, uh, spell and things like that. And we've got uh, our always popular uh, wind up book series where the cars uh, go around pages of the book and tell little stories. And cool. So, yeah, uh, we've got quite a bit uh, uh, to give out, and uh, I'm sure the kids will be happy with it. Excellent. So, uh, I got a two part question for you. How long have you been involved? And why have you stayed committed to this program for so long? Okay, um, I started uh, 30 years ago in 1991. I was asked uh, by the Hall Exeter Museum to photograph the flights. I was a lighthouse photographer and um, just kind of had uh, um, uh, experience with the Coast Guard and, and um, I just thought it was a one-time opportunity and um, kind of led to quite a bit more. And uh, here I am 30 years later and um, still enjoying it and uh, still involved because of uh, just the, I think, um, the opportunity to do something for these Coast Guard families. You know, they're often under-recognized and I think this is a great way to uh, give back at the holidays and show the Coast Guard families that uh, the work they do is appreciated. Absolutely. So how can people help if they'd like to uh, help the Friends of Flying Santa in some way? Well, uh, main financial. Uh, that's it. Donations are what keeps us going. Um, we're very fortunate to have the helicopters taken care of right now, but at some point, I'm sure down the road, we'll have to start putting the bill for those helicopters and it'd be nice to have the money to be able to do that. Um, and also for the toys. I mean, that's our, our single uh, biggest expense is uh, paying for you know, over $15,000 worth of toys every year. So uh, people want to help out uh, financial donations. Also, when we get our cruises back up and running, they're uh, welcome to come out and support us through uh, a lighthouse cruise. Right. And people can donate through the website, right? Yes. Uh, FlyingSanta.org. We have a donation page. They can pay by credit card, PayPal, or print out a form and uh, pay by check. Right. It's not hard at all. So I have one more question for you. We are uh, giving away a prize near the end of the event tonight. And I think I see the prize sitting behind you there. We'll be selecting a name at random. Can we get a good look at this guy? So that is a, a very special edition of one of the yearly Flying Santa animals, right? Yeah. Uh, well, actually, the, the animal this year is like a mountain goat, right? But this is a, a special, special one. This was uh, sent to us specially by the Stuffed Animal House up in Canada, uh, just as a, a contribution to the program. So we're happy to uh, give this away today. So. Does he have a name? For a good home. <laughs> okay. Does he have a name? Uh, no, that's up to whoever wins it. <laughs> okay. All right. We'll let them name all right. So thank you so much, Brian. Uh, we have some very special guests tonight. We've asked uh, the speakers to keep their remarks to no more than five minutes. If you hear sleigh bells, that means the next speaker is arriving by sleigh. Yeah, there we go. And you need to wrap it up. And if you find the sleigh bells annoying, uh, please uh, know that it was all Brian's idea. I had nothing to do with it. So at this point, I'm going to give a presentation on Flying Santa history, which will last approximately 15 minutes, and then we'll have some more special guests. So let's get into my presentation here. These uh, 
film clips you're seeing right now, the uh, aerial views uh, were taken during the Edward Rowe Snow era, but mainly by Edward Rowe Snow himself during some of the, the flights over the New England lighthouses. And I'm gonna start my presentation at the beginning. It's always a good place to start uh, with the uh, Winkapai years, the Captain William H. Winkapai years. This is Captain William H. Winkapai, aviator, adventurer, and founder of the Flying Santa program. He was born in 1885. He was a native of Friendship, Maine in the mid coast. And he was nicknamed Captain before he ever flew a plane because he sailed coasting vessels and yachts. He started flying in 1911. He was a civilian instructor during World War I. And after the war, he started flying seaplanes out of New York. He then returned to Maine. He uh, flew mostly amphibious airplanes. He often flew sick and injured islanders uh, in the Penobscot Bay region to medical facilities, and he saved many lives, <coughs> excuse me, uh, as he, he flew mostly amphibious airplane. Okay, I'm going to start at the beginning. It's always a good place to start with the Winkapai years, which began in 1929. This is Captain William H. Winkapaw, an aviator, adventurer, and founder of the Flying Santa program. He was born in 1885. He was a native of Friendship, Maine, in the mid coast. And he was nicknamed Captain before he ever flew a plane because he sailed uh, coasting vessels and yachts. He began flying in 1911. He was a civilian instructor dur during World War I. And after the war, he started flying seaplanes out of New York. And he then returned to Maine. He flew mostly amphibious airplanes. He often flew sick and injured islanders in the Penobscot Bay region to medical facilities. And he certainly saved many lives by doing that. Uh, this particular plane in this picture is a 1929 Fairchild seaplane. At night and in bad weather, he often relied on lighthouses to get to his destinations. The keepers would often watch for him to pass and would relay word to the airfield and he got to know many of the keepers and would visit them sometimes. By 1929, Captain Winkapaw was overseeing operations of the Curtis Flying Service of the Rockland Airfield, as well as the nearby seaplane base. On Christmas Day, 1929, he loaded his plane with about a dozen packages containing newspapers, magazines, coffee, candy, and other items. He dropped the packages at the lighthouse, lighthouses in the Rockland area as a gesture of gratitude to the keepers and their families. The flights got a great reaction from the keepers. He expanded the flight in the following years. Uh, I should say the flights, he expanded the flights in the following years to more of the main coast and to the other New England states. The Winkapaws moved to Winthrop, Massachusetts in 1933. Their flights by then uh, went to as many as 91 lighthouses and coast guard stations. Bill Jr. helped out on the flights. In 1934, Bill Senior, I'm, I'm sorry, Bill Winkapaw Jr. became the youngest licensed pilot in Massachusetts at the age of 16. He flew on some of the, I'm gonna start over again. Okay. And I'm gonna start my presentation at the beginning, which is always seems like a good place to start. Uh, with the Winkapaw years, which began in 1929. This is Captain William H. Winkapaw. He was an aviator, adventurer, and founder of the Flying Santa program. He was born in 1885. He was a native of Friendship, Maine, in mid-coast Maine. He was nicknamed Captain before he ever flew a plane because he sailed coasting vessels and yachts. He started flying in 1911. He was a civilian instructor during World War I. And after the war, he began uh, flying seaplanes out of New York, and he then returned to Maine. He flew mostly amphibious airplanes, and uh, in the course of uh, his job, he, also, uh, he flew mostly amphibious airplanes. He often flew sick and injured islanders in the Penobscot Bay region. Let's start one more time. Okay, I'm going to start my presentation at the beginning, 1929, the Winkapaw years. And this is Captain William H. Winkapaw. 
He was an aviator, adventurer, and founder of the Flying Santa program. He was born in 1885. He was a native of Friendship, Maine, in the Midcoast. He was nicknamed Captain before he ever flew a plane because he sailed coasting vessels and yachts. He started flying in 1911. He was a civilian instructor during World War I, and after the wars, after the war, he began flying uh, seaplanes out of New York, and he then returned to Maine. He flew mostly amphibious airplanes. He often flew sick and injured islanders in the Penobscot Bay region uh, to medical facilities and certainly saved many lives. This is a 1929 Fairchild seaplane in this photo. At night in bad weather, he often relied on lighthouses to get to his destinations. The keepers would often watch for him to pass and would relay word to the airfield. He got to know many of the keepers and would visit them sometimes. By 1929, Captain Winkapaw was overseeing operations of the Curtis Flying Service at the Rockland Airfield, as well as the nearby seaplane base. On Christmas Day, 1929, he loaded his plane with about a dozen packages containing newspapers, magazines, coffee, candy, and other items. He dropped the packages at the lighthouses in the Rockland area as a gesture of gratitude to the keepers and their families. The flights got a great reaction from the keepers, expanded the flights uh, in the following years to more of the Maine coast and to the other New England states. The Winkapaws moved to Winthrop, Massachusetts in 1933. Bill Winkapaw Jr. helped out on the flights. In 1934, Bill Jr. became the youngest licensed pilot in Massachusetts at the age of 16. He flew some of the route that Christmas, and he flew on his own to some of the lighthouses the following year. Uh, this is Captain Winkapaw and Bill Winkapaw Jr. demonstrating his bombardiering technique in 1936. Uh, La Terrain Coffee, you see La Terrain on the plane here. La Terrain Coffee was one of a family of companies. The parent company was the Quimby Company in Boston. They were a longtime sponsor, and that's why you see some of the uh, early planes with La Terrain on them. This is Straitsmith Island Lighthouse uh, in 1936 off Rockport, Massachusetts. This is the same year the Winkapaw is flying by Boston Light. Uh, America's oldest light station in 1936. And here are Bill Jr. and Bill Sr. loading up for another Flying Santa flight. And we're gonna move on to the Edward Rowe Snow years. This is Edward Rowe Snow, who was born in Winthrop, Massachusetts in 1902. He became one of the most popular historians and storytellers of the New England coast. He wrote 40 full length books and many shorter ones starting with Islands of Boston Harbor in 1935. And over the years, he usually included his latest book in the Santa packages. Uh, Mr. Snow was teaching history at Winthrop High School in the 1930s, and Bill Winkapod Jr. had him as a teacher. In 1936, uh, Mr. Snow flew with Bill Jr. to 25 stops in Southern New England, while Bill Sr. flew the Northern route. A newspaper article said that the packages that year weighed 16 pounds each, coffee, cookies, silk hose, magazines, almanacs, candy, cigarettes, and a book were some of the items in the packages. This is 1938, Graves Light in Outer Boston Harbor. In 1938, Bill Winkapaw Sr. flew to Bolivia to fly gold and mining equipment, and Edward Rose Snow made the flights that year with Bill Jr. This is Edward Rose Snow with his wife, Anna Merle Snow. In 1939, Bill Sr. returned and shared the flights. Anna Merle, Edward's wife, flew for the first time in 1940 and flew with her husband just about every year after that. Edward Rose Snow was not a pilot. I should make that point. He always hired a pilot and plane every year. The flights were cut back during the war years, uh, and Edward Rose Snow was back as the Flying Santa in 1945. This is a film clip of Cuddy Hunk Island at the end of the Elizabeth Islands in uh, Buzzards Bay, and that is the old Cuddy Hunk Lighthouse that was torn down many years ago. In 1945, Mr. Snow dropped presents at Cuddy Hunk uh, for keeper, keeper Octave Ponsart and his family. And one of the packages uh, contained a doll for the girl you see here, Simond Ponsart. She was five years old. She was the daughter of Keeper Ponsart. Unfortunately, the package with her doll hit a rock and the doll was broken. 
That's the sad part of this story, but it gets, gets much happier. The next year, well, in the meantime, before the next uh, Christmas season, the Ponsart family moved from Cuddyhunk Lighthouse to West Chop Lighthouse on Martha's Vineyard. So the following year, Edward Rowe Snow hired a helicopter for the first time to do that year's flight so he could actually land and hand a, a new doll to little Seamond. And here are some photos of uh, Edward Rowe Snow as the Santa with uh, with uh, Seamond there and her parents, Keeper Ponsart and his wife. The one on the lower right, I think, was taken another maybe year or two later. He came back and visited there more times after that. This is uh, Captain Winkapaw again, uh, and this is a, another a very sad part of the story. On July 16th, 1947, Bill Winkapaw suffered a heart attack shortly after taking off from Rockland Harbor. His cub cruiser seaplane plunged into the harbor. He and his 20-year-old passenger both died. Uh, Winkapaw was 62. The memorial service was attended by lighthouse keepers, their families, and representatives of the Coast Guard, Army, and Navy. This is 1947, classic Flying Santa picture at Boston Light. Uh, during his main flight as Santa in 1947, Edward Rowe Snow dropped a wreath in Rockland Harbor in memory of Captain Winkapaw. That year, Mr. Snow visited 176 lighthouses from uh, Canada to Florida. This is uh, Edward and Anna Merle and their daughter Dolly in their basement in Marshfield, Mass. Uh, the snows moved from Winthrop, Mass., to Marshfield on the South Shore uh, about 1950, and we'll talk more about this uh, kind of thing with Dolly in a little while. This is Sankety Headlight in Nantucket. Uh, this picture was in Life magazine in 1951. Edward O. Snow always included a self-addressed uh, postcard in the packages so the keepers could write to him and let him know that he got their packages. Uh, as you can see, this one, uh, I'm not sure of the year, but it was from uh, a Coast Guardsman stationed at Mount Desert Rock Light Station. You see the video taken by Edward Rowe Snow there on the left. One of the most remote light stations in America, more than 20 miles offshore. And if you read it, he says that the, the package was found in February in a crevice between the rocks, but they dried it out. Nearly everything in it was usable and readable. <laughs> and he compliments whoever packed it. Uh, so he definitely got some interesting responses. Yes, Dolly. 1948. I've got the other oh. side of the postcard. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay. 1948. Thanks. I'll, I'll remember that next time. And this is a really interesting story. Uh, this is this is also 1948. Uh, that's Whaleback Lighthouse in Kittery, Maine in the picture. And in December 48, Edward Rose Snow dropped a bundle from a plane for the keepers at Whaleback, but the first drop was too far for the keepers to recover. Three weeks later, a man walking on a beach in Sandwich on Cape Cod found the package 90 miles from where it had been dropped. Years later, the man still had the book that was in the packages, Edward Rowe Snow's Storms and Shipwrecks of New England. And there's the family again, uh, circa 1960s. I don't know if you can place it more exactly, Dolly, but okay. <laughs> somewhere in the 1960s. And I'm gonna play a brief newsreel here. This is really quick from 1959, and I hope you'll be able to hear it. It was the day before Christmas when the New England coast awaited Ed Snow, who was taking his post as the Santa he played for 25 years, each and every December, as Yuletide came near. Could you hear that? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, that was Boston Light and that, uh, that clip, and uh, this is also Boston Light. And the house that uh, was in the video and that you see here is an old duplex house that was uh, demolished in the early 60s. So it's not there anymore. But uh, there you see some Coast Guard keepers and one of them holding the package over his head. This is 1958, this photo. And here is Edward Rowe Snow about to drop a package at Sankety Headlight on Nantucket. And if you look closely, you see his wife, Anna Merle's hand behind him holding that window open so he could throw the package. And that plexiglass window was made especially for the Santa flights. And Friends of Flying Santa actually owns that window. It was uh, donated to the organization some years ago. So it's one of the artifacts in the Flying Santa archives. This is uh, Edward and Anna Merle, uh, probably sometime in the 1970s. 
moving on to the Hull Life Saving Museum years. Uh, Edward Rowe Snow suffered, suffered a stroke in 1981. He was not able to fly that year. The director of the Hull Life Saving Museum, just south of Boston, approached Anna Merle Snow and asked if she would mind if the museum carried out that year's flights. And of course, she agreed. So in a small ceremony at Logan Airport, Edward Rowe Snow's Santa suit and hat were presented to Ed McCabe of the Hull Life Saving Museum. And that's, of course, Anna Merle and Dolly on the right. And here is Santa Ed McCabe with a helicopter pilot. That year, the first year the, the museum was involved, they flew to over 20 lighthouses from West Quaddy Head in Maine down to Rhode Island. Uh, there's a story about Ed McCabe's black beard. Kids would ask why Santa's beard was black and they, were, they would always be told that Santa's beard doesn't turn white until Christmas Eve. Edward Rowe Snow passed away in 1982. Uh, the flights were cut back to about 15 lighthouses in the 80s as the lights were being automated and the keepers were being removed. But uh, since then, they've expanded to visit uh, many Coast Guard stations and some lighthouses run by civilian organizations. By 1997, the Flying Santa program had outgrown its position within the museum. A small group of volunteers banded together to form the Friends of Flying Santa Incorporated. And this is uh, Anna Squamlight. So most of the, the pictures you see for over the years in, more, in the last 30 years uh, from the Flying Santa flights were taken by Brian Tigg. This is Anna Squamlight in Gloucester and Boston Light again, the greeting in the snow there. And this is Warwick Light in Rhode Island. Uh, some of the families, personnel and families from uh, CEU Providence, Civil Engineering Unit Providence, Rhode Island. This is Santa Dave Waldrop at Anasquam Light in Gloucester. Uh, Dave is a retired uh, Coast Guard warrant officer who has played Santa quite a few times. This is uh, Santa CWO Tom Guthline, uh, an active uh, chief warrant officer in the Coast Guard. First flew in 1997. He had been the executive petty officer at Station Gloucester and his family, he and his family were living at Anasquam Lighthouse and were visited by the Flying Santa and he decided to become involved and he's done a number of the flights. This is Santa Dave Considine several years ago at George's Island of Boston Harbor. There was a special event in the summer uh, honoring the Flying Santa and Edward Rowe Snow. And uh, he's with uh, my old friend, John Forbes, the late John Forbes, who used to run a lot of cruises for uh, friends of the Boston Harbor Islands. But Dave is a, another retired Coast Guard officer who's played Santa quite a few times. And this is Bill Donahue, another retired Coast Guard officer who's played Santa in, in a number of the uh, recent flights. And this is John Roberts, who's an active Coast Guard officer. I knew uh, John when he was in charge. I still know John, but I, I got to know him when he was uh, the officer in charge at Station Portsmouth Harbor about 10 minutes from where I'm sitting. And uh, John has very ably uh, portrayed uh, Santa in a number of the recent flights. This is uh, Santa Dave with uh, Santa Dave Waldrop, that is, with uh, Dale Hardy, who was the pilot for over 10, one of the pilots for over 10 years for the Flying Santa, a great guy and a great helicopter pilot. This is a Fisher Scientific helicopter passing Portland Headlight. Uh, and uh, this was kind of adapted into the Flying Santa logo, great picture. And if there's time at the various stops, the uh, kids get to uh, have a little time in Santa's sleigh. I'm not sure, I haven't actually said, also I'll say it now while I'm thinking of it. The, uh, of course, for decades, the Flying Santa would drop presents out of a plane, but starting with the switch to the Hull Life Saving Museum, it's, it's been helicopters ever since then. And the helicopters land at the various stations and Santa hands out presents to the kids. I just wanna make that clear. This is from 2003, it's Plymouth Light of Massachusetts, also known as the Gurnet Lighthouse. And uh, during that year's stop at uh, this lighthouse, there was a great uh, reunion here. That's Brian Tagg and Dolly uh, Snow Bicknell on the right. And in the middle is Simon Ponsart Roberts. You saw Simon when she was a little girl at Cuddy Hunk Light. And uh, he, Mr. Snow uh, visited her at Martha's Vineyard the following year and gave her a new doll. Simon flew along as an elf uh, in 2003 uh, and uh, had the greatest time. And she was always in touch with the Snow family over the years, but I believe this was the first time she and Dolly actually met. So it was a fun day for everybody. This is uh, 
um, 2003, I think, or maybe four. Uh, that is Bill Winkapaw III on the left, and in the center is Connie Small, author of The Lighthouse Keeper's Wife and The Wife of the Last Keeper at Portsmouth Harbor Lighthouse. This was taken in the mess at uh, Station Portsmouth Harbor, and I was lucky enough to know Connie. She lived to be 103, just a great person. So this was another nice moment uh, in Flying Santa history. And this is the unveiling of a plaque and an exhibit at the main Lighthouse Museum in Rockland. On the right is Bill Winkapaw III. On the left is Ken Black, known as Mr. Lighthouse in Maine, the founder of the main Lighthouse Museum. And I, I know a lot of people uh, here at this event know, knew Ken Black personally. And that is uh, the close to my presentation. There's a, another satisfied customer waving, uh, see you next year, Santa, again, Anasquam light in Gloucester. So let me get out of screen sharing here. Stop share. There's a lot of, a lot of buttons to click. Okay. All right. Give me a moment here. My papers got a little mixed up, but there we go. Okay. Um, so Simon, Simon Ponsart Roberts, who you saw in my presentation, and then you saw her when she flew along as the elf. Uh, she wanted to be with us tonight, but she couldn't. Uh, she sent a lot of along a message that I'm going to read now. Uh, Simon said, quote, I totally love that my Santa is once again being applauded and even more importantly remembered. I always felt that he was unforgettable and I'm so happy I'm not the only one who feels that way. The whole Flying Santa program as it continues to delight over all these years is so outstanding. The kids of today are the people of tomorrow who will never forget the kindness of joy this has brought to them. When I see December approach, I'll always think of the Flying Sorry, I'll always think of those times long ago for myself and the times ahead for all the children who are beloved of the Flying Santa. Kids need to be made felt special, and this is what it does. This year, I again wish you safe and wonderful flights. They are truly love from the sky. Our next very special guest is Sally Snowman. And I think most of you know who Sally is, but for anyone who might not, uh, I think lighthouse buffs pretty much know who Sally is, but Sally is the keeper of America's oldest light station, Boston Light. She's the only woman keeper in the history of Boston Light, which goes back more than 300 years, and the only official lighthouse keeper in the United States today still employed by the federal government. Sally is also on the board of directors of Flying Friends of Flying Santa. Hi, Sally. How are you doing? Good Hi, evening. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Hello. Hey. Oh, it's so exciting to be a part of this. Thank you for the invitation. And um, I've been involved with the Flying Santa for 25 years. And the first experience I had on Boston Light with well, Jay, too, is before I got put on the Coast Guard payroll in 2003, Jay and I began being assistant keepers out of the light. And our first experience with Flying Santa was in 1995. Um, and of, the photo that had um, Boston Light um, with the snowfall and the uh, Merry Christmas, Jay and I were the ones that shoveled that out to do that. So it was <laughs> great to, <laughs> to see cool. that. Uh, and then um, as I uh, went on onto the, the payroll, that was great because now I didn't have to schedule the duty to have be there when Flying Santa came to the island uh, because I was a keeper. I could be there. One of the last times that's recorded of children being on Boston Light to greet Flying Santa was in 2001. It was there was a, a third class um, MK engineer that brought his two children out for the day. And so the uh, children since that time and a little before that were just a uh, the keepers that were on the island as we are children, as grown up children. Uh, and then um, we've been having Flying Santa come to visit us. The last year they were able to come was in 2017. And uh, being the keeper and having Santa come, it was like the first time 
every time. It was just so exciting to watch the helicopter coming along and hearing the whoop, 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 and when there's snow on the ground to make sure they are under cover so we don't get blinded by it. Uh, and then have them come into the house and we have cookies for them and they'd have the, the, the gift for the, for the house and we put it under the Christmas tree. And, and this is in the, the 21st century and it's just so exciting. I just can't imagine what it must have been back in the early days, in the, in the 30s and the 40s for uh, having that gift fall down to the island and trying to fetch the packet out of the bay. So it's uh, been um, uh, a pleasure to be on the board of Flying Fanta and having had the, the years that I had and actually experiencing the helicopter landing on Little Booster Island. It's uh, something that I'll never forget. So thank you again for inviting me. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally. You know, there's so many great moments, Flying Santa moments connected with Boston Light over the years. And I know that uh, because Edward Rose Snow lived in Withrop, Massachusetts, right on Boston Harbor, that he would sometimes visit Boston Light. And uh, there's actually a film clip from, I think, the mid 60s with you, Dolly, and uh, your father uh, going ashore at Boston Light when Ken and Ken Black was there. He's in the, in the clip on the pier. Uh, so maybe we can talk about a little bit more about that in a little while, but you could probably do a book on the history of Flying Santa and Boston Light. I should, Sally's written two books about the history of Boston Light. They're really excellent, but I, I recommend very highly. So there he is. There's Bob. It was, I hadn't seen, seen you. Now I see you, Bob. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce my good friend, Bob Trapanning Jr., who's the executive director of the American Lighthouse Foundation. Many of you know Bob is a lighthouse preservationist, but he's also an amazing photographer. Any of you who follow him on Facebook or Instagram know that. And he's got a new book that's just come out uh, called Rockland Breakwater, A Journey Through the Seasons. And you can learn uh, about that and some of Bob's other projects at momentsinmaine.com. Anyway, Bob, it's great to have you here tonight. How's it going? Oh, it's going well, Jeremy. Great to be here. So you've, uh, you've actually uh, seen the Flying Santa in action over the years in, in Rockland, is that right? I have, and I think before I just go into that a second, I think I'll just give you some random thoughts about some of this history here, if sure. you don't care. You know, I think um, when you look at, at this whole thing with the Flying Santa, um, lighthouses were about service, they were about dedication. Uh, there was a little bit of tragedy, there was a little bit of heroism, but it was very little heartwarming. And I think this tradition is probably, in my opinion, the most heartworm, heartwarming aspect of lighthouses from that 1929 period on um, that you just can't, you can't find anywhere else in lighthouse history. You know, in reading about this through the years, as many people have, I think this really had an impact on the offshore lights, the families who had these offshore lights and couldn't get back to, uh, to shore, couldn't get to the mainland. Uh, sometimes couldn't come November, couldn't get off that light for weeks at a time, maybe not even got Thanksgiving dinner or got their Christmas, you know, supplies for dinner. So having Flying Santa come over was something to uh, greatly look forward to, help them, you know, kind of segment through the winter. I think that was awesome. I think too, uh, you know, I read where one keeper's family said that their children, it was the first time they saw an airplane. And, you know, you really think about this in the 30s, that's really kind of cool. You think about that from just even from a cultural standpoint. And then, um, you know, uh, you, the other thing is all of us have very fond memories. So you think about these keepers families. Well, some of our memories were exciting. Some of our memories were adventurous, but this one I think just touched the hearts of people. And I think that's what etched the flying Santa in the minds of so many people, which I think is really cool. And so when I look at it today, you have that same element of sacrifice and dedication that the lighthouse service had that the US Coast Guard and their families have. And I think what the Friends of Flying Santa and Brian and what has done is been able to connect. Uh, lighthouses are a big part of the Coast Guard history. I know lighthouses are sort of taking a backseat anymore in the 21st century, but they're always gonna be a part of the Coast Guard heritage. And to see the Coast Guard connected to this tradition, even unto today, it, it's, it's just amazing. So oh, I think we're all kids at heart and to be able to watch these events in person and see the excitement. You know, of course, the little ones are just bonkers out of their mind about the excitement. But you know, I think um, 
mom and dads are just as much as excited to watch all of that. So uh, it, it's been a pleasure. I do want to, I did have something that I did want to read to you guys that it was uh, from the Christian Science Monitor in uh, December 16, 1936. And uh, I'm just going to quote a couple paragraphs here. It said, quote, some amusing experiences have marked the lighthouse flight in the past years. On the 1933 hop, a bundle was dropped at a light near Ipswich, Massachusetts. The keeper was away as the plane swept down out of the wintry sky. He had left his garage door open and the bundle found its way into the garage and was waiting for the keeper on his return. In 1934, a bundle that was marked for the station at Cape Elizabeth, Maine landed squarely on the fender of a Model T Ford, carrying away the fender, but doing no damage to the securely wrapped bundle. And lastly, it says last year, a bundle carried away a small picket fence at Monhegan Island. The keeper there wrote to Captain Bill saying he was leaving the fence in the same condition because, quote, all the children on the island know that Santa Claus had a small accident with a present when he arrived. So I thought that was pretty cool. And those are the kind of memories that make this whole tradition amazing. So uh, thank you to the Friends of Flying Santa for continuing to do something like this. Thank you, Bob. That was all really well said. We really appreciate it. I think he's a couple of people applauding this now. So thank you. Thank you so much. Some of what you said reminded me that uh, 30 years ago or so, I was interviewing a Coast Guard keeper who said to me, you know, the, the keepers and families and some of the more isolated lighthouses, they wouldn't have Christmas without the Flying Santa. So true. It really made a big difference to people. Uh, let's see. Next, um, we have a really, really special guest someone who knows the history of the Flying Santa, <laughs> probably better than, than anybody. Uh, of course, Dolly Snow Bicknell is the daughter of Edward Grove Snow and Anna Merle Snow. And she flew along with her parents on the flights each year for, was it more, um, more than 15 years? You can, can you, un, you can unmute yourself, Dolly. You yeah, here we go. Here. Just stay for a long time. A long time. <laughs> a long okay. time. Right. I'm saying more and than every... Yeah. Flight. Every flight was a very long flight. Okay. <laughs> because it was very rough. <laughs> okay. Um, but we'll let me talk just... about that later. Okay. I'll, I got some questions for you, but I'll finish. Deal. I'll finish uh, my introduction first. Uh, I just want to say that Dolly is also a lighthouse preservationist, and she's uh, she's many things, but she is a lighthouse preservationist. She's president of Project Gurnet and Bug Lights, an organization that takes care of two lighthouses in the Plymouth Mass area. So following her father's footsteps as a, as a preservationist. Uh, so um, my first question is, what was it like being uh, such an integral part of the Flying Santa tradition for, for so many years? Well, it was an honor, but I didn't really realize it at the time because I was dreading the flights every year. Um, I was thinking about this today and whenever we went that I remember there was a it was a five seat plane and there was the pilot in the front and maybe a photographer on the on the in the co-pilot seat. My dad was behind the pilot with his special window and then somebody was next to him and I was in the back and I had all the packages packed all around me so that I because I'd have to hand them up to them. And I don't know if I ever got to see anything out the windows except in front. And it was so rough. You have no idea. We would get to the lighthouse, circle it once. If nobody came out, maybe circle again. And of course, we're not just circling, we're going up and down. And then we would drop a package, maybe another package, and then circle again to make sure that the package had been gotten. And then we'd go off to the next place. And I did enjoy the fact that the window opened because fresh air came in, but it was rough. And that's, those are my memories as a child. I was so glad when we'd land at Rockland, Maine, because that's where our relatives were and I could get out and I could it's a mare. not be sick. <laughs> it was quite a challenge. And having been fortunate enough now to have gone on the helicopter. The very first time I went and I got a call from Brian saying we need an elf. And I went, oh, yay. Oh, no. <laughs> What's it going to be like? And Evan was the, the pilot. And it was magic. 
Yeah. It was so smooth. He was such a great pilot. And I remember telling him it was like a magic carpet ride. And the difference is amazing. It's also wonderful to be able to interact with the kids. I mean, we'd drop packages and then we'd see them holding the packages up and saying thank you. But that was about it. And then we did have the cards that they sent back that my dad had put in, in there. And I do have a list of things that were in the packages. And I actually have found some of the things that from the past when you get to that part. Okay. So, we got some go, um, go and tell. You, yeah, we've got show go and tell if you're ready. Sure. We can um, do that but now. You want? Do, you want to, do you want to talk about the ping pong table? I do. I do. Time, that, what we, Sh shall I ask you the rest of the questions I'd like I to ask and then we'll get to the show and tell? Why don't you do that? Okay. Go ahead. All right. Ask your uh, question. I was wondering, uh, why do you think your father uh, kept the flights going for so long? What did they What did they mean to him? What was so special for him? Well, all his direct ancestors were sea captains uh, on both sides of his family. And I think that that's perhaps why he was so interested. And he had such respect for the lighthouse keepers who, you know, told ships where to go. And the lighthouse keepers really interested him. And he realized that this, this was a very special thing. Um, as I said, I have some of these cards that I was going to, I can read to you later on, unless uh, Brian does the sleigh bells. Um, you haven't done that yet, Brian, have no, you? We're, we're a little bit ahead of schedule. So we haven't resorted to, <laughs> I don't think we'll be resorting to the sleigh bells anytime soon. Okay. But I think he realized how important this was and because he would see these people at the lighthouses when he'd go to them in the summer he'd go visit and they would tell him what this meant and by the way Bob Trapani that was magnificent you're you're talking about that that was really very impressive thank you so much and while I'm there hi Sally nice to see you again <laughs> So, Go ahead, Jeremy. Ask yeah, you me mentioned the ping question. pong table. Mentioned the ping pong table a few minutes ago. What was your house like in the weeks leading to Christmas? Okay, so in the cellar we had a ping pong table, and it became Santa's workshop. Every part of the table had stations. My dad would cut twine that would be nine feet long. He'd tie a bowline. He'd tie them over a, a pipe so that he could grab them. Then he'd have piles of cigars and cigarettes when they were fine for you because they didn't they were fine then um, and then uh, candy lollipops chewing gum pens and pencils sunglasses wait should we do the show and tell so sunglasses look at these those are crazy huh those are actually from that so from those, those yes. days yes and then this is what they this is actually what they were in. Wow. A little thing to keep them from. Look at that. Wow. Isn't that something? And he had, in the later years, he had these pens that, that said, Edward Rowe Snow, Flying Santa, 1968. This one says, um, so where are we now? Uh, chewing gum, pens and pencils, sunglasses, balloons. And here's some of the balloons from the past. This was my favorite because it would get to be like six feet long. Wow. Um, the, all sorts of things like that. And then they had um, Gillette razor blades. Look at these. Does everybody remember when we had these? The, um, yeah, they're dangerous. Yeah. Dangerous. There we go. Yeah, I should, and I then later I on, there was. <laughs> Maybe this one. Um, and then there were paperback books. This is Ellery Queen, Death Spins the Platter. Okay. The Runaways and Though I Know She Lies. Ooh. So paperback books that went in there too. For the, oh, you want to read that one? Okay. <laughs> you can read it to us. Um, what else? Gillette Razor Blades, Puzzles, A Doll. Now this is a little doll, <laughs> but I found these. Wow. And then this, these were some planes and a jet plane. Oh, look at this. Cool, huh? Yeah. And 
These are um, a warship, I think. Battleship. I don't know. Battleship. Or maybe the Titanic. Right? That looks like an ocean liner. And these are yeah. these are metal. These are metal. Yeah. Um, so um, always a copy of his latest book. This one's famous lighthouses. Mm -hmm. And then we'd wrap everything in newspaper. And then I even have some Excelsior. This is what they oh, wow. wrap everything else in. It's like, um, I don't know what it is. It's like hay. And that was for, um, for padding and for buoyancy in case of a less than direct hit, which unfortunately happened quite a bit. Uh, and then at the end, the packages were marked by my dad with S for stag, D for doll, F for family, and sometimes dog in case they put in game burgers or something like that. And he always had the self-addressed stamped envelope, uh, I'm sorry, postcard that read, we have received your package, and then a line for the Coast Guard station. And those cards that were returned to him enabled him to claim 94% accuracy in those 40 plus years. So you showed some other ones. Look at this one. Can you see this? Is that the right thing to do? Somebody drew things. It yeah, looks like little somebody little... got hit by a, yeah, got hit by a package. <laughs> Can you see slightly that? Higher. Can you hold it slightly higher? There yeah. you go. Cool. Yeah. Well, that's great. I and then, and then this one, um, this one's from Portsmouth Harbor Light. We received your package in very good condition today, 23 December 1948, and many thanks. It was a good shot and landed right beside the light tower. In behalf of the men here and myself, I want to thank you again for thinking of us at this time and to wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Portsmouth Harbor Light and Lifeboat Station. Newcastle, New Hampshire. It had just and become then, a station at that time. That's really? That's right after okay, so Connie that's, Small and her husband left and the Coast Guard moved in there. That's 1948, Yeah, it says here. Okay. And then this one says, Dear Sir, we have received your package. I was sure glad to find it. Not only did it make me feel that Christmas was here, but it gave me the feeling that here on the Eastern Coast, lighthouses were not being forgotten. It makes me feel happy to know that there is still some kind people left in this crazy world today. I'm sure that you are one of the most kindest of them all. I thank you so very much for the package and I wish you a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. And this is from Matinicus Rock Light. So Matinicus oh, Rock is a long way yeah, out. Very, very and this one here um, from um, Block Island. Uh, thank you very much for our package. We really appreciate it as it's our first Christmas away from home. Also, we enjoy your books very much and are happy to have one now. So that's just, those are just a couple of the ones that I thought were pretty special. Yeah, yeah. Uh, by the way, speaking of dogs at the lighthouses, if people can see Jeff, he's got uh, Augie there. And those of you who are lighthouse buffs might be able to guess who Augie is named after. Uh, you might have heard of Augustin Fresnel, the inventor, inventor of the ah. Fresnel lens in lighthouses. So, who was in your uh, last uh, your last Zoom podcast that I saw? He was a guest. Augie was a guest. Fresnel. Oh, oh. Okay. <laughs> Not the uh, dog. Augie's a frequent <laughs> guest, but yeah, uh, we actually had Monsieur Fresnel make an appearance at our last event, or yes. in the person of Joseph Smith, who does an amazing job, an actor who plays him. Yeah. Um, I so uh, I'm wondering, uh, do you have any thoughts about why the flights should continue today after all these years? Everybody loves them. The Coast Guard needs to be recognized. And Brian needs something to do. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> those, are, those are all very good reasons. So uh, I'm going to uh, move along in a moment, but I don't want to cut you off till it's also interesting. Is there anything else you wanted to show us or, or tell us before we, we move on? Let me, can I, um, I had written this one time about 10 pound island light in Gloucester. Yeah. For that story. Yes. Can I, I, I sometimes that? tell that in my lectures, but I, I left it out today because of 
time. He knew I was going to, I knew I was going to say something. Yeah, Can I read it quickly? It's a great story. Okay. My father thoroughly enjoyed Keeper Hastings, his wife and son who lived at 10 pound Island Light in Gloucester. Early one December morning, Mrs. Hastings heard on the radio that the flying Santa would be flying in the area that day. She suggested to her husband, who was reading a magazine by the wood stove in the kitchen, that perhaps they could do something special for Mr. Snow. Hmm, what could we do, he said, and went back to reading. Mrs. Hastings didn't say a word, but went to the cellar for some old newspapers, which she rolled up and with them formed the letters Merry Christmas on the lawn. Then she nailed them to the ground so they wouldn't blow away. When my father flew over, he was delighted and took several pictures, which he gave to the Associated Press when they la landed later that morning to refuel. The late afternoon paper caught the eye of the keeper's son as he returned from school. He bought the paper and rode back home. There was his father still sitting by the stove reading. Dad, look at this, look what mom did. For there on the front page of the paper was a four column picture of his own lighthouse with a greeting Merry Christmas on the grass. Sheepishly, the keeper agreed that his wife indeed had done something special. So that I just uh, queued up a picture here. I'm gonna share a screen to show show a picture. Is that it? Oh, that's great. That's it. Oh, that's she did a good Island. job. <laughs> yeah. That's a lot of newspapers. <laughs> yeah. And also, I'll just mention for uh, some of you know, uh, if you're familiar with 10 Pound Island today, all that's left is the lighthouse and a little oil house. All those other buildings were torn down, sadly. Not too long after that, actually. Okay. And all I, the one last thing is my dad loved all the signs, which is why when Flying Santa had gone to Garnet in the past, I tried to always make something out of tennis balls that said, hi, Santa, or ho, 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 or, or something. But I remember one time, and I do remember this, um, flying over Curtis Island Light, and there was a sign, and everybody looked. My mother, my dad, I did, and the pilot did. And all of a sudden, the pilot went, oh, Mount Batty! <laughs> <laughs> he was so interested that he had forgotten that there was a mountain there. <laughs> Good thing you remembered. Uh, yes. Good thing he did. <laughs> oh. the way, Bob Trapani lives in Camden, so Curtis Island is his hometown yeah. lighthouse. I'm sure he enjoyed that, <laughs> that anecdote. So thank thank you so much, Dolly. We could thank you for having me. It's it's so wonderful that the the tradition continues, and I'm so glad that you were able to do it this year, in spite of all the things that are going on. I mean, I the the keeper the well the keepers, um, the coast guardsmen must be thrilled. So thank you very much. Yeah. Good job. Thank you, Dolly. And uh, for those of you, it might be some of you who listen to, yeah, <laughs> some of you who listen to the podcast, uh, Lighthearted, I do for the U.S. Lighthouse Society. I'm interviewing Dolly in a few days for that. I've interviewed her before about her lighthouse preservation work, but I'm going to, we're going to talk for a uh, longer time about Hour. her flying, hours <laughs> and hours and hours about her flying Santa <laughs> experience. And I interviewed Brian last year. So if you uh, go to news.uslhs.org, news.uslhs.org, you can uh, look up all the, the past uh, podcasts. And Brian was a guest uh, about a year ago. So then that was, that was a good one, even though it was Brian. So <laughs> speaking of Brian. Once in a while. Um, Speaking of Brian, I'm going to turn things back over to him, and Brian's going to introduce a, a couple more special guests. Brian, I'm throwing the ball into your court at this point. So you uh, unmuted? There you are. Yeah. Yep. I'm just uh, seeing if Dave Fontenine is unmuted and John Roberts are unmuted. John and Dave, you can make sure you've unmuted yourselves. I, I did. Excellent. I'm unmuted. All right, great. Uh, yeah, so uh, Dave Constantine and John Roberts are two of our current Santas. Uh, we have four, um, Tom Gutline and um, John uh, Bill Donahue. 
are also uh, our Santas and they'll be flying with us. Um, uh, Dave, you started uh, with Flying Santa, was it back in 2005 when you were at Stacey Chatham? Well, it was actually, I think before that in 2003 when my daughter was born because she was an infant at uh, Plum Island Light, I think in 2003, but um, I, I think that's when that started. So yeah, we've been uh, part of it since then. So uh, almost 17 years, or which is great. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they still come out. We, we have an age limit, but some of the kids are grandfathered in so that uh, they've been participating most of their <laughs> lives. They continue to come. And, uh, and John, John Roberts' uh, daughters are into their 20s, and uh, they're still coming. And Dave, your daughter is, what, 17? 17, applying to college and still looking forward to uh, next next weekend. So Yeah. So, and um, Connor as well is 15. Yeah. So. Now, you first uh, put on the suit how many years ago? Oh gosh, I'm, I mean, you mean as Santa? Yeah. I think it was after I retired in 2011, so it must have been 2013, maybe. I think uh, the George's Island light stop. So, and then I, I flew with Dolly, right? At one point, you were my uh, my elf, which I think is probably one of my most memorable occasions ever. Was to have you aboard for that. So. Mm -hmm. Um. Sorry, I just, uh, I must have accidentally called someone um, in the Coast Guard and they just texted me that I, I, I've been talking to other people while on the phone with them, so. Well, the working on the flights is a 24 hour job, right? Yeah, yeah, no, this time of year, I get about five hours of sleep a night. Um, so it's, uh, excuse me if I'm a little out of sorts, but uh, we've got, uh, we've got uh, about 600 toys going out this week uh, to restocking points along the route. So um, as soon as you wake up in the morning, uh, the gears start turning and you're up for the day, but, uh, but Dave, um, uh, you've done a great job uh, as Santa. And um, I, I remember uh, your son uh, was a little skeptical one year and um, came up to you at the beginning of the stop at Merrimack and said, daddy. Yeah, he said, is that my daddy? And I said, of course not. Ho, 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 ho. And so he, he bought it. He, he yeah. didn't think it was me after that. But um, I think if I have two seconds to say anything to everyone that's on board is that Brian Tag has done an amazing job and he does not take any pay for this. He does not even take a stipend and he does all of this behind the scenes for nothing. So if anybody deserves a big round of applause, it's Brian and if people want to unmute yourselves for, for a minute here. You can do that for, for this occasion. You're here. Yay. Amazing, Brian. Hey. Yay, Brian. Oh, there you go. There you go. <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Hi. Brian, how can we... Nancy's in the next room over, and she's clapping as well, so... <laughs> can we... I just ask you real quick, how can we support the Flying Santas with cash donations, or how can we... Donations are great, because that helps us buy the toys. Um, that's where all the money goes. We get our helicopters for free, fortunately. And all the money goes towards purchasing the toys. And, um, you know, we do a lot of good research into what to get. And, um, and that's the best way to support the program because it's always a struggle to raise money for any organization, but especially this year with, uh, you know, the restrictions on COVID. Um, financial donations, no matter how small, are greatly appreciated. It all adds up in the end. Well, so how... Do we give to the U.S. Us. Lighthouse Society or do we donate to specifically to the... FlyingSanta.org. If you go to our website, uh, there's a donation page, and you can either pay by credit card or PayPal or print out a form and send a check. Okay. Okay. I'm just going to ask uh, everybody uh, if you could mute your microphones again. So, uh, except for John Roberts and Dave Considine and Brian, if you want to continue your conversation. But, okay. Thank you for the recognition. I appreciate that. Thank you, folks. And I, and I will tell you, it's very hard to be a Santa with, with Brian because he spends the entire day primping your beard so that you are absolutely perfect when you get out of that helicopter. And and it's a, a lot of work during that flight day as well. Plus, he's taking pictures the whole time. So yeah. as a hundred and, contract, he is a Santa handler. There's no question. <laughs> and they can't stop to make a stop. And they can't, so they can't drink much. They can eat cookies, but Santa's wearing that suit from the get-go. Yeah. And the other you thing is about what I just said. 
as a Santa is to thank all the people on every stop because when you have a stop and, and one of my most memorable is actually at the Rockland Lighthouse Museum. They are so good to you when you get there and, and Dolly's, uh, but not Dolly, sorry, uh, Sally Snowman, when you get to Boston Light is one of the only times you actually get to take your beard off during that day, <laughs> unless there's a, a child there, but you actually get to take off the suit and actually eat something for a second before you uh, take off again. So um, I need to get on that flight. I've never had to take off the suit. No, we don't do that anymore. <laughs> you got to stay in character the whole day. Yes, sir. That was the, that was great to be able to stop at Boston Light and take off your your beard and sit down for a second. So that's when we ran behind schedule. <laughs> like I said, a handler. Yeah. And have Sally's cookies. Were Sally's cookies the best ever? Yeah, very good cookies. Yeah, although one year mine disappeared somewhere along the way, and I still haven't found out who took them. But I need another batch, Sally. Could have been um it could have been one of um my grandsons because they have gotten to be and my daughter has gotten to be an elf and both my grandsons and i think that's probably where one of the cookies went they, from. they respect me they wouldn't do that so are you uh oh hey, all right so let's say say a little bit about uh john roberts john yeah in the santa for what about three four years now 2017, I got called up to the big leagues, Brian. <laughs> this is my uh, this is my fourth year. That's the first year I met I met Dolly. Um, a little a little backstory. I mean, I've been doing this since 2003. It was the first time that I uh, I met Flying Santa and, and and saw firsthand the logistical genius of Brian Tag. Um, I was the XO at uh, Station Point Judith down in Narragansett, Rhode Island, and Santa landed and was handing out gifts. And at the end of the whole thing, there was a little boy and I'm looking at him and I'm looking at Brian and I, the XO had forgot a name. And I was panicked. I was grabbing things off my desk. I was gonna give the kid a stapler and he never, his pulse just stayed perfect. And he went right out to the helicopter and said, of course we have his gift. It's just, I'll be right back. And he came right out of the helicopter, had the gift for the kid he was absolutely ecstatic. And uh, I was hooked, um, my kids, have been participating since then, and they're 23 and 21, and they're uh, pretty stoked about December 6th at Station Gloucester. So like you said, some kids get grandfathered. I ask every year because I don't want to get in the way with uh, with money and, and giving it to a 23-year-old kid, but we have every little little uh, stuffed animal stacked up from 2003 to, to, to present day. Every Christmas, that's part of decorating the house. So it's pretty fantastic. Um, for me, probably two of the biggest things were the connection with you, Dolly, which I didn't even know until about 2005. Um, my father gave me a book, and it was the first uh, the first book that my grandfather had purchased when he came back from World War II. Was your father's? Uh, it's a first edition of your father's uh, The Lighthouses of New England, and he signed it over to me, given you know our participation. And uh, and secondly, uh, what absolutely got me hooked was in 2000. 11, I was finishing my tour at Portsmouth Harbor Light where I had met Jeremy and uh, I was headed over to Iraq and, and Bahrain for a year. And while I was there, somehow uh, Flying Santa figured out how to get gifts to my kids when my feet were in the sand. So uh, I was absolutely hooked and uh, we've been a, a part of it ever since. So when I got called up to the bigs in 2017, I was absolutely beside myself. So there you go. Mm -hmm. well, yeah. You done a great job john um all the santas bring their own personality and uh um it just you, you can't pick a favorite because they all uh, do very well with it and uh we just think it's neat that we can continue the tradition with coast guard personnel um who better to be able to enjoy the the opportunity of uh of experiencing this than you know active duty and retired coast guard personnel and uh, we're happy to have them we have dave walter who started the tradition back in the early 90s and um, Dave did fantastic for a number of years. He knew a lot of the crew members and a lot of the kids and uh, we're just thrilled to have Coast Guard personnel uh, putting the seat on for us. Okay. So, uh, Brian, uh, do you feel uh, that this conversation is at an end so we can, uh, or do you want to have a, any other uh, things you want? I'm not, 
I'm not pushing anything here. We're actually ahead of schedule. But yeah, um, one thing I would like to mention, and it kind of gets overlooked a lot because they don't ask for attention, is the uh, helicopter sponsors. Um, we've got JBI helicopters that's doing the main flight this year. We've got Tuckmore Aviation that's doing the Massachusetts flight. And we've got Stuart Auerbach who's uh, doing the New York, Connecticut, Rhode Island flight. And um, a lot of these folks were um, uh, introduced to us by Evan Wild, who's one of our longtime pilots. And um, they do it for free. The fuel, the pilots, everything for free. And and they come along and they say it's the best day of flying all year because they have so much fun doing it and seeing how much the first day families appreciate it. So I can't say enough for uh, the helicopter pilots and the sponsors for what they do for this program. Because um, I know with, with Mr. Snow, he had to pay for these charters and that was thousands of dollars. And for us to be so fortunate. And the insurance. Yes, the insurance, yeah. <laughs> the insurance so, is not good. Yeah, so it's, uh, we've just been really fortunate and uh, to have folks like JBI, Ray Newcomb, that. Uh, since 2007, he's been supplying us a helicopter. Um, it's just, uh, they don't want any recognition. Uh, they don't even ask for a tax write off. They just are happy to do it. And uh, we've been very fortunate with our helicopters. I'm glad you mentioned that helicopters and pilots. That's such a very, very important <laughs> part of the whole thing. I just want to mention before we move on that I flew with uh, the Flying Santa for the Massachusetts flight several years ago. And the, I'll tell you, I did nothing except uh, sit in the back of the helicopter and get in and out at the stops, but I was completely exhausted at the end of the day. Uh, we started before dawn and ended uh, well after sunset. And uh, just to see how hard Brian worked and Santa worked that day and the helicopter pilot, uh, that exhausted me watching them all day. So it's pretty incredible what they, what they do every year. So at this point, I'm going to play a little video. Unless, did you have anything else you want to add at this point, Brian? I want to mention something. If anyone's down in Hyannis uh, in, in the next couple of months, they're doing an exhibit at the new Mass Air and Space Museum on Flying Santa. So there's some photographs, some memorabilia, uh, some artifacts from the uh, Edward Rose Snow Year. So uh, it's uh, off of 132 in Hyannis. Uh, you can find it online. It's the Massachusetts Air and Space Museum. And probably for the next two months or so, they've got an exhibit on Flying Santa. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So I'm going to play a little video here and I'm going to go to share screen again in a moment. This is a video made by uh, CT now in Connecticut uh, from a little while back, but it's, it's a really good illustration of what happens at a typical Flying Santa uh, stop. It's a really nice little video. So I'm going to share screen. And here we go. The sound is glittering as little children wait patiently, <laughs> breathlessly anticipating the arrival of a Yuletide legend. And then, in a flash, he appears out of the clouds and zooms past Stratford Point Lighthouse. It was unbelievable. My son was so excited to see the chopper come in with Santa Claus. Forget Dasher and Dancer, good old St. Nick is flying in style aboard a very small and agile helicopter. It was pretty cool how they circled around and, you know, the kids just went nuts. They loved it. From his high-tech sleigh, he can see welcoming waves and big smiles. So he descends as the breeze blows like crazy, creating flurries of gleeful excitement. Windy and windy, it looks like a tornado. After a year of being nice, not naughty, the kids see flying Santa step out of the chopper, ready to make their Christmas dreams come true. Here comes Santa Claus, here comes Santa Claus, right down Santa Claus Lane. This all dates back to 1929, when a float plane pilot named William Winkapaw started literally dropping sacks of presents from the sky onto the grounds of coastal beacons so that the families of lighthouse keepers could have gifts and supplies for the holidays. So he figured it was a pretty lonely existence out there at Christmas, and he wanted to go out and uh, give them packages of coffee, candy, magazines, books, and uh, flew over on Christmas Day. When lighthouses became automated, the tradition changed but remained just as special. Now, 82 years later, Flying Santa honors the families of Coast Guard personnel, our current heroes of the waters. They're out there doing their job every day, and this is our way of saying thanks for what they do. 
This modern day flying Santa visits 33 lighthouses and Coast Guard stations in three days, delivering presents to more than 700 children from Maine to New York. Just a great appreciation that they recognize us and everything, and all the kids, and you know. All of us out here to coming together as you know one big family. And the children's faces clearly show the magic of the season. Ah, oh, he is so excited. Like now he believes in Santa Claus. <laughs> Something he'll never forget. Feeling like it's cool and awesome. For goodness sake, don't feel bad for Rudolph and Prancer. No, the reindeer rest up for Christmas. So <laughs> we, we don't want to wear them out. Santa is full of energy as his whirly bird slowly lifts off, bound for many more merry moments. A beautiful nautical tradition, full of volunteerism, gratitude, and good cheer, the perfect sentiments for Christmas time. You know, there's nothing commercial about it. I mean, we're here doing our job as, as a, a gesture of appreciation for what the Coast Guard does, and, and uh, we're happy to do it. That's Mommy Minute. Merry Christmas. Sarah Cody, Fox, Connecticut. Oops. Okay. Oh, I think that's a very nice little video. So the next thing we're going to do is pick the prize winner. And I would tell you to get your raffle tickets ready, but we're not doing that. So, like I said, I've, uh, I've discovered a, a fun way of doing this. And I'm going to go back to share screen. And figure out where it is. This is the window I want. There we go. And this, believe it or not, this wheel has the names of every single person who registered for this event, unless anybody registered after eight o'clock, after seven o'clock, I should say. Uh, but everybody who registered uh, before the event started is, is their names are here. I know you can't read them, but believe me, they're all there. So I'm going to spin this wheel and it's going to randomly select somebody. So here we go. Oh my God. <laughs> that out of 300, almost 400 people, that's the name was selected. Uh, rigged, rigged. Santa the, can't the, win. Is Dave? Uh, is Dave there? He's there. Uh, what do you think, Dave? <laughs> I guess. Oh, he's he's not unmuted. Let's unmute him. Okay. Does he realize he his name just came up? Just ask him to unmute. No, I, I do realize my name came up, but I, I can't accept that. One, because I have a 110-pound black lab that'll eat it. <laughs> <laughs> the second thing is, is that there's somebody else out there much more deserving of, than me, so I think you should respin. Employees of the North Pole are not eligible. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank exactly. you, Dave. I don't know about the deserving part, but, but thank you for that. And yeah, it would make a great dog chew toy, but we don't want that. So I'm, I'm going to go ahead and spin it again. Spin it again. What was the what were the chances of your name coming? This better not be John Roberts. Hopefully that's the end of 2020. <laughs> Terry Vasquez. Vasquez is the winner. If Terry is here, if, if Terry is not here, we're gonna pick somebody else. If Terry is here, please digital you can actually uh, if Terry Vasquez is here. I don't know if that's a he or a she can unmute yourself. Uh, I don't see her in the list. I don't see them in the list. Well, you're just seeing the first page of people that are here, right? Um, Terry Vasquez, are you here? If so, please unmute yourself and let us know that you're here. If, if you don't do that in about 10 seconds, I'm going to uh, spin again. She's not here. OK. Give it another the sleigh bells, Brian. <laughs> All right, here we go again. Third time's the charm. Wanda Garrison. 
Vonda Garrison here. If so, unmute yourself, please, and let us know you're here. No? <laughs> Not in the list. We didn't lose that many people, so. Well, we had almost 400 people register, and I don't know how many more than 200 we actually got in the room. So I'm going to try it again. Try it again. Okay. Victoria Duffy. Victoria Duffy here. If Victoria Duffy is here. Please unmute yourself and tell us you're here. She's uh, not the list. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no? All right. Here we go. Huh. Tom Fregman. Tom, are you here? Tom is here. Tom is here. Let me get let me get out of screen sharing here. Give me a moment. Tom Pregman is some, somebody I haven't yeah, seen. I'm right here, I'm right next to you on the screen. I'm hey, right Tom. next to you, Jeremy. How are you doing, Tom? All right. It's been a while. Good to see you. You should, yeah, play, well, you should play Santa one of these years with the. Yeah, uh, I'm uh, working on it. Put your hat down. I got my hat. He's got his hat. And I got my beard. It's a little short right now. Yeah. But you get and you've got the flying beard. Santa hat. He's got the flying Santa hat. That's oh, great. yeah. I'm, I'm equipped, man. I'm, yeah, you're dressed. You were I'm dressed a team player cool. here. Let's go. Yeah. So, oh, Tom, nice if you could, uh, you want uh, Tom to send you his address in the chat, Brian? Want to do it that way? Yeah, or you could, uh, yeah, absolutely put it in the chat. I'll, I'll, I'll grab it down. I think we already have it in our uh, records anyways. But yeah, I'm sure you do. Should, yeah, yeah, we donate all the time and uh, we can okay. talk. Yeah. Well, you, can, can just, you can just email it. I'll just send you an email. Don't. Yeah. Okay. I think that's cool. Yeah. Congratulations. I only want a small one on a boat cruise one at a time. So, <laughs> and so uh, this is a big heater. You got to take that's care a of big... <laughs> Yeah, that's a big one. Woo! Yeah, so it's about the size of uh, Jeff's dog, Augie. I think they're very similar in size. I got somebody who might like that for Christmas, too. So congratulations. I got a new two-year-old nephew that's a, a oh, well. grand-nephew, I guess. You could have it. Yeah. yeah. That would be great. Uh, so this was a very good show. This was excellent. I, Thank you, Tom. We're almost I really enjoyed near the it. end here, but we're expecting another very special guest Gary, we know if our special guest has arrived, Brian. Uh, Gary, one one quick thing. Um, yeah. Can you ask if uh, Bill Winkapaw is out there? I, I saw um, Denise uh, in the list, but I don't know if Bill is with her. I'm sorry, I was distracted by by an important text from a very important person. Um, ask that again, Brian. Uh, I, I noticed Denise Winkapaw in the list, so I was wondering if Bill Winkapaw was with her. I know he was going to be on a trip this weekend, but. Uh, yeah, he, he told me he almost definitely wasn't going to make it. Okay. But if. Uh, Denise... Hold on. Hold on one second. Let me get him. Oh, here we go. Oh, he's here. <laughs> oh, fantastic. This is uh, Bill Winkapaw. This is Denise Winkapaw. Um, uh, Bill Winkapaw III, uh, the grandson of uh, Bill Winkapaw. Bill. Hi. Brian, how are you? Very well. How are you? Hi, Bill. Hey, how are you, Jeremy? Good. That was Jeremy, right? There he is. Yeah. Sorry, sir. Yeah. Long I got in just in time to miss my grandfather's years. <laughs> but yeah, it was very, very good art, very good run here on the podcast there. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah, Bill Bill came up back in uh, 2004 for the 75th anniversary. 75th and we're anniversary. The yeah. So. And yeah. the dedication of the Lighthouse Museum. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. 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 Bill and Denise uh, continue to support the program each year, and we're very appreciative. And uh, they've been very generous. A lot of these photographs that you see from the Winkapaw years, they all came from the Winkapaw family. Bill's put together a binder with all that information and has shared it with us. My pleasure. This has been a great outfit. You guys keep the tradition going. It's fantastic. Wow. Was that, uh, was that your son that was going to move to Maine because the Winkapaws get treated like kings up there? Yeah, they know us. They know us up there, Dad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's the little one. Yeah, you remember him? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> he got treated pretty well up in Maine. 
No. <laughs> he still talks about it. Yeah. <laughs> Helicopter ride and everything. <laughs> <laughs> so that was, uh, it was great having them up there. It's just a shame they're down in Georgia. So it's a long ways away. And one of these years we'll get them back maybe for the hundred. So. There you go. One of us will make it. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, maybe both. <laughs> 10 years. Yeah. yeah. So, so, Bill, being the grandson of, of uh, William Winterbottom, what's it feel like to have this program still going 91 years later? Oh, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. The dedication of everybody involved who's kept this thing rolling is fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. It, and, and like Dolly said earlier, it's the children and how they get a kick out of it. And it's just, it's an amazing thing you guys keep. And it's the help, the people who keep doing it. That's, that's, I'm just amazed with it. Just keep this tradition going. It's fantastic. Um, well, it's a, it's been an honor for us to have your family and uh, Dolly's family involved. Um, you know, that's that's what really gets to our heart is that we still have the connection with the wind paws and the snows, you know, going back over the whole 91 year history. So uh, we appreciate you being involved. Yes, sir. It's my pleasure. Great. Absolutely. I, I second everything Brian just said, and I'm so glad you could be here tonight, Bill. Thank you for hey, ran in a little late, make... but yeah, the rest of it was great. Yeah. Great. Glad you made it. So uh, next, uh, you know, we're almost done here, but we've saved a very important guest for last year. And uh, our next guest might be known to some people as Father Christmas, St. Nicholas or St. Nick, maybe Chris Kringle. But I think most of you know him best as Santa Claus. Hello, and he's just arrived. There he is. Uh, Santa. You all here? Hello. Good to see you, Jeremy. How are you? Good to see you. I'm good. And I've been very good all year, by the way. Just are you sure? <laughs> well, uh, it is mostly. 2020. <laughs> uh, so, Santa, um, how are you feeling about this year's flights? Are you all, all prepared? Uh, we are very, very excited. Brian is right next door. Uh, working feverishly, getting ready for the flights. And uh, he's had to work extra hard given this uh, difficult year, but we're ready to go. Excellent. And I'm just wondering in general, uh, what are, how do you feel about uh, using a helicopter to visit uh, children? Well, you know, technology, we all have to embrace it. And while Rudolph is still a little upset and his nose is out of joint, um, <laughs> we're adapting. We're adapting. Uh-huh. So, uh, of course, this is a kind of a, a, this takes place before Christmas and you have a lot more work to do on Christmas, but uh, I think these, these Flying Santa flights are pretty important to you. What do you enjoy most? What's the most fun part for you about the Flying Santa? It has to be the pure joy, absolute pure joy in children's eyes. Before Christmas, on Christmas, but for these Coast Guard families up and down the coast, it's the pure joy. Brian or Dolly, maybe, or Jeff? Any of you have any questions for Santa? Hello, Dolly. <laughs> uh, Santa, are you uh, filling out that suit or are we gonna need padding this year? Um, we're still using the padding for now. Retirement's coming. You know, you have to work on that belly. No COVID weight, huh? You keep taking all the cookies on every flight, Brian. I should be good. Well, there won't be any cookies this year. That's the that's the real uh, uh, difficult thing we're going to have to put up with. No cookies. I'm sure some elves will take good care of you. All right. As long they as they're not gluten-free. dropping on the plate. As long as they're not gluten-free. All of us will have all the gluten and all the sugar. <laughs> that's what keeps More us going here. Better. Cool. So. Well, Appreciate Santa, you. does anybody else have any questions for Santa? Brian, Jeff, Dolly? Before? I'm good. I'm good. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, right. Santa. Right. Santa, Thank you, so, Santa. So, Thank you. What's that? Thank you for coming. Oh, absolutely. Santa. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. I wouldn't have missed it for the world. Well, Thank you for doing it. What was that? Thank you for doing it. Yeah. And happy Thanksgiving to everybody. Yes. Happy Thanksgiving to everybody. So thank you so Thank much, you. Santa, for being tonight. We really do appreciate it. Uh, before we wind things up, I just want to see if Dolly, Jeff, Brian, Sally, Bob, anybody, or Dave, or Santa, if you have any uh, last words before we wind things down here. Anybody uh, like to add anything? 
I just like to say thank you everyone for your support. I mean, whether you've sent in $5 or you've come on one of our Lighthouse Cruises, all that is contributed to this being a successful program. And it, it, it's been a pleasure for me to be involved for 30 years because everyone that's connected, you know, the people that do our uh, embroidery, the people that do the teddy bears in Canada, they just love being a part of the program. And, and um, it's just because of folks like you that have supported us that we're still going 91 years later. And we'll just mention again, flyingsanta.org, the website, and people can buy Flying Santa merchandise, uh, sweatshirts, hats, hoodies, uh, the children's book, uh, the book Everyday what? Heroes, True Story of a Lighthouse Family that I co-wrote with Simon Ponsart Roberts is also and our available. Flying Santa hooded sweatshirt. Ooh. Can't get any more fashionable than that. Wow. Can you answer some of the questions that were sent in? Oh, we've got questions, Jeremy. Chat. Yeah, I've tried to uh, answer a couple, but it's hard to monitor the chat as I'm doing this. Uh, let's see if, are you coming to Situate this year is one of the questions. Uh, no, we're not going to any of the civilian south this year just because of um, you know the control um, issue. With the Coast Guard stations, we can keep people in their cars and restricted, but in the public areas, we just don't want to have 200 people gathered together for Santa. Um, and have anything go wrong. So uh, no civilian stop this year, but they'll be back on the route next year. Mm -hmm. um, just quickly running through here, see if there's any other questions that haven't been answered. Hey, Brian, this is Jeff from the Society. I know this is primarily a New England program. Have you guys ever uh, toyed around with the idea about expanding a little bit to different parts of the United States? Uh, no, uh, specifically for the reason of um, we only fly on weekends, and it's very tough, especially here in New England, to get good weather dates. I mean, we've actually had a few years where we've had to fly after Christmas because we've had ice or snow or rain. Um, so we've got it to a point where it's 1,200 children from all the Coast Guard units from Maine, New Hampshire, Mass, Rhode Island, Connecticut, and all of Long Island. And it's a tremendous task to do this every year. I personally couldn't see expanding it beyond what it is now. <laughs> Um, it's only so much you can do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it is a full-time job for me, uh, seven days a week from September until uh, the flights are over. So um, expanding it to other parts of the country, yeah. I can't see it. Yeah. I, and, and you want to maintain it um, the way it is. You know, you don't want to make it any less of an experience uh, for the Coast Guard families. Or, um, I, I just think we've got a good control over it. I never imagined we'd be up to 1,200 kids and, and be able to include all these Coast Guard units, but we put a hard push in and uh, we're able to do it. But I just could not see us expanding beyond this unless we started doing the flights in September. And I don't think people are ready for Santa Claus coming in September. Brian, Jeff just wanted you to bring him a present. Oh, is that what it is? Okay. <laughs> Maybe one for <laughs> Well, so I know Edward Rousseau would do that. He would jump on a plane. He would deliver presents on the East Coast and jump on an airliner and then do the West Coast. West Coast. Um, so he did as far south as was it Bermuda? Um, yep. And well, Bermuda, down to Florida. And too. then Florida. Mm -hmm. We went to Bermuda. Yeah. And the Great Lakes, maybe a couple of times, or at least once, anyway. Maybe. I know he did the Great Lakes area. I didn't get to go there, and that yeah. was fine with me. But Eastern Canada <laughs> also, and including the Magdalene yes. Islands, that was interesting. Well, one of the best radio clips I ever heard of Edward Rose Snow during the Flying Santa was he was up in the Canadian Maritime, and he asked a young girl what she wanted to be when she grew up, and she responded, a woman. <laughs> well. Smart child. Very literally. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> That was a Canadian Broadcasting Corp uh, radio clip that we came across uh, a number of years back, but it, it just it strikes me as, uh, you know, that was that was a smart ass and talented remark that I'd, I'd like to give. But. Yeah. Um, so Colette asks, uh, what year was that film, The Stratford Point Light, that video clip we played? Uh, was a few yeah. years ago, I'm not sure what year. 2011, I believe that was the clip. I didn't think it was quite, quite that long ago, but it holds up really well. It, you know, things haven't as far as the experience of Santa at these places, it hasn't hasn't changed much. Just looking to see if we missed any questions. And can Santa give us a ho ho ho? Ho ho ho! Of course, Dolly. Perfect. Thank you. I think we, we got if, at least most of the questions. I'm sorry if I missed anybody who asked a question in the chat, but um, I don't know. What do you think, Brian? Should we? Uh, 
open things up to more questions if people have any or, or sure. yeah. we're here if people have any questions for us we're happy to hang around if you you know if you uh if you need to leave we understand that but maybe we can take a few more minutes if anybody has any questions probably the easiest way to do it is uh you can do it in the chat or you can uh, click on participants at the bottom of your screen and on the window on the right you should see the option to raise your hand digitally somebody's already done it a couple of people have so i guess they have I questions did, so we're did gonna you see that some, someone asked what the lighthouse behind you was gotta be portsmouth harbor oh, light it's portsmouth harbor yeah with the christmas lights that's from oh. a couple of years ago Ooh, somebody's yep. wrong uh so i'm gonna uh unmute deborah wilder who was the first one to raise her hand or asked to unmute. Uh, Deborah, you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Go ahead and ask your question. I was just wondering if there's a way to buy the flying Santa stuffed animals from previous years. I just learned about this program this year. Yes, I actually have a, a stash in the North Pole attic of uh, previous year uh, of the stuffed animals, the beavers, the brown bears, the polar bears. So uh, if you want to send an email to info at flyingstandard.org, I can give you a list of uh, what we have available. I just connected with you on Facebook. So can I just send a message through Facebook? Uh, sure, Jeremy, are you able to read those messages? Because I've had some trouble lately. Yeah, um, if you can, Deborah, it might be, if you don't mind sending an email, that might be the best way to make sure it gets I've got to the paper, Brian. so if you can tell me that email address again. It's info, I-N-F-O, at flyingsanta.org. Thank you very much, Brian. You're welcome. Thank you, Deborah. Okay, Earl is next. And, okay, go ahead, Earl. Yeah, just a question for us, uh, Sally Snowman and her family. First of all, thank you for your service to our country. Um, you have a coveted job. And I guess my question to you is, what is your most memorable um, event out there on the Boston Light? I mean, the oldest light in America. Flying Santa. That is the highlight of the year. That is such a big deal for me. Um, we really do the house up nice and we have the coffee or cocoa on and the cookies and we wait for the helicopter to land. And um, I feel like I'm a five-year-old whenever, whenever they land. And I get paid for it. It's amazing to be at a job where I get paid to meet and greet Flying Santa and, and the crew. That's so fantastic. Thank Great. Uh, thank you, Earl. And next we have Sandra Ware has a question. To unmute yourself, Sandra. Go ahead. Okay. I just wanted to know if the weather has ever hindered your flights. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> we've, yeah. Had, uh, we've had many issues uh, with weather over the years. We, we want to be safe, so we don't take any risks. So we, we did the main flight one year where we flew all the way to Jonesport, and uh, we're making our way back to Portsmouth Harbor. And about halfway through the flight, uh, the pilots told us that, you know, the weather was closing in and the safest thing to do would be to park the helicopter and rent a car and uh, just drive the rest of the way back to Portsmouth and come back another day. But we have postponements. Like I said, uh, it were two years in a row that we had to do the Connecticut, New York, Rhode Island flight two days after Christmas. Um, you know, the kids were still excited, but at that point, the parents were like, Christmas is over. Um, but we still went and uh, the kids enjoyed it. But uh, yeah, weather's, uh, it could be, it could be 50 degrees, uh, but you've got a lot of rain and low clouds and helicopters don't do well in that. Um, so we uh, always wanna be safe and uh, you know we're relying on our pilots and they'll let us know, hey, we'd love to get you up, but it's just not safe to do it. And we'll just uh, do it another day. So we, we never cancel, we always postpone. So um, the kids will get their presents one way or another. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a major factor. Uh, so thank you, Sandra. And uh, next, uh, Roderick has a question. Hi, good evening to all. Um, again, thank you all. This was a great presentation. Uh, question is, uh, how far down south on the East Coast do, do your flights go? And have you ever like come down towards like the uh, old Cape Henry or new Cape Henry lights? 
Uh, no, in the 31, 30 years I've been doing it, um, we, uh, we've gone as far south as uh, Jones Beach, New York on Long Island, uh, and that's the limit. So uh, um, again, it's time, it's weather, um, and it's also financial. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, so we always say, you know, we fly from Jonesport, Maine at the northern end to Jones Beach, uh, New York at the southern end. Great, and thank you. And have you ever thought of, of maybe a, like a branch being started in like another uh, state if someone could ramp up with what you do and have a branch like further down the East Coast to service other lighthouses along the coast? I don't know if anyone would be crazy enough to take what I'm doing up here. So if you find someone, Roger. let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Roger that. Again, thank you all very much and a happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Thank, thank you. you, Roderick. Same to you. Uh, Bonnie has a question. Hi, I actually have three questions. The first one is, did the kids ever wonder why Santa came then as opposed to Christmas Eve? My second question is, how do you choose the gifts? And my third question is, did Dolly ever wonder about her dad being Santa? Like, did she like put two and two together and kind of like, hmm, on that one? Dolly, you want to take that one? Sure, I can take that. Um, this was the flying Santa versus Santa Claus. It was just different. And it was a special thing for the lighthouse keepers. And I never questioned it. And it was just the way things were. So, so you, you knew it was your dad while you were flying with them, obviously. Right, right. But you knew um, he wasn't the real Santa. Right. And I, I, I know that sometimes when he would land, people would want him to have whiskers. And sometimes they wouldn't. And one time when he was flying, his whiskers went out the window and he had to land somewhere where they wanted whiskers. And my mother had to drive somewhere to try and find whiskers while Santa was in the plane. It was not a good year for that one. So he just never had whiskers after that. But was you can it? see when he, when he opened the, the window, you know, everything went out. He had to be very careful with his, with a hat. Um, and I never flew out though, yeah. the window, although I wanted to sometimes. <laughs> Wasn't there a year when he got his beard or whiskers in the mail some, a couple of months after Christmas? Yes, right, right. Someone found them and sent them back. <laughs> <laughs> it was a nice one. Thank you for that question, but there were two other ones that I'm not answering. Yeah. Um, I think uh, one was why did the kids wonder why Santa comes early uh, for the Coast Guard kids, and it's always we, it's because the Coast Guard kids, you know, are getting some special attention from Santa, and uh, and it's uh, just to show recognition on I mean, their dedication to uh, um, our country with the job that they do, and so it's just a special treat for the Coast Guard families that that Santa comes a little bit early. Um, we also asked about the toy selection. Um, that's a pretty involved process. I mean, I test out every toy. That's my one of my additional jobs as the chief toy tester with Flying Santa. And um, if if I'm bored with it, it goes back to the store. Uh, but if I'm entertained by it, um, we keep it, and we 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 get the best compliment when the parents tell us that the kid still plays with the gift they got from Flying Santa, or they still have a collection of the teddy bears they've gotten over the years. And um, so we want the kids to be excited about the three things. They're excited about Santa. They're excited about getting a gift, and they're excited about seeing the helicopter. So. We want to come through on all three, so uh, we uh, we don't you know it's not the greatest gift they'll ever gift, but get, but it's just a little special treat that uh, they're excited about. And and I'm there. I photograph every kid getting their gift, so I see their reaction. So it's one of those things where um, a few years early on, I saw the disappointment on the faces of some of the kids, and I'm like I don't want to see that again. So so we do our best to make sure that uh, what we give them is something they enjoy, and uh, we've been pretty successful. Okay, so I think we move to the so next So I just, I just want to say we need to give Brian another round of applause for that statement that he checks all that out and is all there the with every kid with all the toys. He that checks is, out all the toys. That is so amazing. That is so amazing. I just felt it on the screen. Yeah. Fun. Andy also makes sure that there's batteries for every toy that what is light? in there around my picture pretty darn important uh, not muted we were about 2,000 muted batteries every year so um we've got a good selection of uh, nine volts triple a's double a's um, 
But yeah, we don't want the kids to get their gift and then have to wait for batteries. So um, we have a special team that opens up all the toys and inserts the bag of batteries and then reseals it and then we wrap it. Um, so it's a, it's a complete process. Yeah. Uh, Todd has a question. Go ahead, Todd, you can unmute yourself. Uh, well, thank you very much. Um, it's great to, uh, th Jeremy, Brian, Dolly, uh, you, great presentation today. Uh, if you look at my profile picture, that is actually me um, with Santa on Boston Light. And hi, Sally. Hi, Jay. Um, this picture was taken in December 10th, 2010. So my question is, who was Santa that year? Uh, that's Dave Walter. I was say it has to be Dave Walter. Yeah. yeah. Nice. Nice. That's one of our retired Santa. I got it. I, I, I took a bunch of photographs that day. So if you're interested in taking any, uh, putting them in your archives, just uh, let me know. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. No, we, we're, we've got an archive online of photos going back to 1929 and videos. So uh, yeah, we're always interested in adding to the archive. Great. Great, great, great presentation tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you, Todd. Okay, Trevor has a question. Can Hi, uh, first, that was a great, it was a great presentation. I had three questions for you. First, um, I maybe it was covered earlier in the presentation, I didn't hear it. When did you guys switch over to a helicopter? That's the first question after using airplanes for so many years. Second question was, are you guys, were you aware that you were making history all those decades, even as this happening? You know, I'm 60 years old and I remember hearing about this. I've, I've been a Lighthouse fan all my life, but I've heard about this even when I was a very, very small kid. It was fascinating, this, this idea that planes came of remote places and stuff like this. It was an electrifying idea to hear this and it had a lot of coverage. So, I mean, I'm, I'm even here listening to this presentation. I'm very surprised that, you know, for all of the impact this has had, it's such a small operation all the way around. And you've had so much impact over the decades. So were you aware that you were making history all the while, even as you were doing it? And the third question was, how do you guys handle the, uh, the basic need for, and you know, all those hours up there? How do you guys take care of the call of nature and all that. I mean, you must have had some real difficult biological issues over there hour after hour after hour, you know, it must be difficult. Oh, they're, they're troopers. These are Coast Guardsmen. So they're used to being on duty, on patrol. Um, they, you, you give them a task and they do it. So uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, military personnel performing as Santa because they're used to tough conditions. I mean, they could be on their boats, uh, you know, the, the SAR cases, they could be out there for uh, extended periods, uh, really tough conditions. So they can handle a, about a 10 hour day with Santa Claus. They can handle it. Yeah, they do well with it. Um, now you asked about uh, um, when they went to helicopter. That was 1981. Edward Rose Snow made his last flight by plane in 1980. He did a flight out to um, Nantucket Island from Norwood Airport. And then, um, you know, he came, became ill the following year and the Hull Life Saving Museum filled in for him and, uh, and then took it on um, uh, for many years after that when he passed away. So it was from 1980, uh, from 29 to 1980 was airplane, except for one year in 1946 when they chartered a helicopter and went down to see him on Paul Um But yeah, ever since 1981, it's been uh, helicopters. At least part of it, I think also, was it 75 if you used a helicopter? Oh, 1978, yeah. 78, why do I keep thinking of 75 or 78? Uh, partly because they were shooting a, a WB, WGBH TV program, part of a segment for a show called Christmas Heritage. And it seemed like it was easier to use the helicopter for that. I think that was the main reason, Dolly, you might know. Yes. Yeah, because my, my dad didn't like it. <laughs> you can see him in the, he's, he's doing, you know, like this is not what I do. Yeah. Yeah. But he was actually dropping presents out of the helicopter as opposed yeah. to later when they yeah. landed. That's what they wanted. Yeah. That's what they wanted. Yeah. So that's what he did. They took the door off the helicopter and flew from Massachusetts all the way to Maine with Edward Rose Snow, who was 78 at the time. 77? Wow. 76. Yeah. Yeah. That's cold. Yeah. Cold. <laughs> it was not, not good. So were, you, were you aware you were making history even as you guys were doing it? Because it sounds, you know, very, very family, just a few tight families doing this. 
And yet, you know, I've, I've known about this for many decades. And I knew it was old even when I was hearing about it. We're it's fairly close to this. We're fairly close to the same age, Trevor. Trevor and I remember growing up, and every year in the the Boston, uh, I grew up near Boston, and the Boston TV oh, stations, there'd always be a little story on the Flying Santa that year. But I also knew, even even as a kid, I had a vague sense that it was much larger than just New England. People followed this all over the world, and it was an idea that captured the hearts of people. You know, it's it's like the way they are now with NORAD Santa. The idea back then. We didn't have NORAD Santa back then, but we did. A, people knew that there was a place in the world where people were dropping, where Santa was visiting lighthouses by planes. And, it, and, and, you know, newspapers would cover this thing and they knew it was happening. It was like, oh, do you know this happens in New England? And that was many, many decades ago before internet, before popular media and all that type of thing. So you were making a big impact then. I was just wondering if people were aware of it at the time. Uh, we, we've done uh, extensive research uh, with newspapers, magazines going back to the 1920s, and there, it was amazing. This was, this was uh, across the country every year, Flying Santa would get coverage. Um, and then there was uh, coverage in Germany and England. Um, so it was, uh, it was something that it was well, very well promoted, and uh, it, it would get front page photos. Uh, you know, Mr. Snow was a, a very good photographer, and he'd bring good photographers with him, and they get some really neat shots. You know, you've seen some of them tonight with. You know, the plane in front of Boston Light, um, and it was amazing. I mean, I've got I'd say hundreds and hundreds of articles from the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, up to the 60s. Uh, nowadays, it's tough to get coverage. Uh, you know, we've been told the story's been done to death, and uh, you know, there's not as much interest. Um, so it's uh, it's it's fewer uh, articles. I mean, you'll get, every few years there'll be someone who uh, gets some interest and we'll get some coverage. Mm, you might you might see people with more interest because of COVID this year and people being locked in. People need a, a feel good story this year. They really do. So yeah, but but another thing is we like to be under the radar. You know, sometimes you don't want too much attention. Um, you know, when you're landing in backyards and things like that, um, uh, you don't always want a lot of. Uh, you know, we do everything safe and. You know, no, nothing against any rules, but uh, um, sometimes it's it's nice to be quiet and uh, and do your thing and stay under the radar. But uh, but, but yeah, it's uh, it's it's been an interesting run over the years with how much coverage it gets uh, and and uh, the interest that you know you said across the country. So yeah. Well, so thanks for up. answering the questions. This was a great presentation. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Trevor. Thank you for your right. questions. Thanks. So we, it's coming up on nine o'clock. We got three more people with questions right now. How about we, we take those and then close up shop. So everybody, you have, if you have your hand raised already, we'll take your questions, but we'll ask that we cut it off there. So uh, next is Mike has a question. Mike, Actually, if you want, go ahead. It's not a question. It's just an observation for anybody that wants to help at Christmas time. Uh, many different Coast Guard bases do holiday somethings to help people, either uh, the kids of people uh, in the Coast Guard, uh, the base here in Seattle does a uh, fairly large thing where they put together packages for uh, homeless and street kids. And uh, one of the people I know uh, concentrates on teenagers and a couple of years ago, her and her group, I believe, got 700 and some packages out to uh, teenagers that were living on the streets. So if you want to help, I mean, there's no flying Santa Claus with it. They load it all in a truck and go driving around town, I think. But um, that's another way that people can help. So anyway, that's all. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Uh, Jerry? Have a question or comment? You can un unmute yourself and go ahead. No, yeah, go ahead, Jerry. Jerry Daniels. Oh, I think you're you're muted now. Go ahead and unmute yourself. You need to unmute yourself, Jerry. Push the uh, the lower left the mic icon. Just click it. Okay. There you go. Here we yeah. go. All right. Greetings from Northern Minnesota. I'm an 82 year old lighthouse lover. That's photographed over seven lighthouses in the uh, U.S., Canada, 
And uh, my question is 700. 700 and climbed in over 100. And I hope to do more. Um, I would like to know of a great book that would uh, uh, illustrate and chroni chronicalize the uh, flying Santas from day one to the current uh, that also has some of the postcards that, uh, oh, who was it? Dolly had uh, written about. Uh, could you uh, recommend a book? We're working on it. We're working oh, on it. You're working on it. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. And uh, a wonderful program. I've really enjoyed it. Keep it up. Thank you. thank you so much, Jerry. Very much appreciate it. And Earl, again, will be our last. Uh, if you have a question or comment, Earl, you can go ahead. Yeah, a question for Dolly. First of all, you're remarkable. Um, <laughs> I just... This has been a great presentation. Um, you mentioned your early days of the, the, the flights where they were like confining and you know, constricting and all that. What are your highlights? What, what, what made you get back on that plane, that helicopter, et cetera? Well, from the plane, um, you could see the people and their excitement and, and then often during the summer, we'd go visit, visit the lighthouses by boat and the people would talk about how wonderful this flying Santa was and, um, you know, being able to go out to the lighthouses again, you know, and actually physically go there was just wonderful because as you know, lighthouses are kind of special. Um, in the, as being an elf with the, with the Flying Santa helicopter, that's just remarkable because you get to see Santa work his magic with the children. Um, every Santa that I've ever been with would always say, you know, Joey, you need to work a little bit harder in school, but you've done, a, you've done really well this year. Um, but but you know, be nice to your family, and I mean, just really nice things that Santa would do. So it's it's just such a feel good thing, and um, I've been good, by the way, Santa. If you're wondering. Oh. <laughs> Thank Santa's you. Santa's listening. I see him. He's listening. I see him too. <laughs> I just want to know where Santa got the monkey in the background. That's a a, a monkey on the. Oh yeah. These are yeah. all, a few of the toys. I don't remember a monkey. <laughs> oh, I don't remember a monkey either. Has there been a flying yeah, Santa monkey? Just, or? There are sometimes there are special toys. So, I see. Yeah. Okay. Not, not everything gets released to the general public. Santa gets the special toys. Yeah. He, he okay. deserves it. It was tough to control the monkeys in the helicopter, so we couldn't master. Yeah, the monkeys could have would have been a problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. More fun than a helicopter full of monkeys. Right. <laughs> um, so I think we should, uh, we could talk all night, obviously, and maybe, maybe people would like to, maybe we'll do it again sometime. I'm sure we will. Um, but uh, at this point, uh, I think we're going to close up shop. But I want to thank, uh, of course, Jeff, Brian, Sally, Bob, Dolly, uh, John, Dave, and last but not least, Santa. Your the, and Bill the Third, also, of course. Thank you all for being with us tonight. Uh, Brian, you want to add something? Yeah, I, uh, Nancy Adams just uh, made a point on the uh, messaging that uh, just let people know that we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization. So all uh, contributions are tax deductible. And um, Nancy is a very generous donor this year. She's been a big help in supporting us. You know, we weren't able to do the cruise and she stepped up and was just uh, outstanding with her generosity. So we very, uh, very much appreciate uh, Nancy's uh, contribution. And, um, and John Rooney, uh, you know, they've been supporters for uh, for years down in Sidhu, and uh, we appreciate them. Uh, mm -hmm. Thank you to everybody who's supported the Flying Santa. And again, flyingsanta.org. If anybody feels they'd like to help in some way, just go to flyingsanta.org. You can buy things. You can make a donation. There's all kinds of ways and you can help out. If I can add, Jeremy, we have a YouTube page that's got... Yes. Uh, uh, a lot of videos. Uh, we shot GoPro for the first time last year, and uh, we've got quite a bit of GoPro footage from the helicopter inside and out. 
and um, and then uh, video footage from the Evergrow Snow Years uh, that Dolly's providing us. So there's quite a bit on our YouTube channel, um, just uh -huh. uh, YouTube and search for Pawnee Yeah. Uh, Dolly, did you want to say something? Yes. Oh. <laughs> No? Well, you muted yourself, I think. Unmute. Okay. There you go. I wanted to thank you, Jeremy, uh -huh. for what you did. Because this couldn't happen without this program couldn't have happened without you. Well, well thank you. It's very much my my pleasure. I uh, it's the least least I can do. Uh, you know, Brian does, as you know, Dolly, Brian does. The, the lion's share by far of the, the work. So it's nice to be able to help out now and then. Uh, Jeff, did you want anything on behalf of the US Lighthouse Society? No, that's it. Uh, I appreciated uh, the presentation. And to me, uh, flying sand just epitomizes why we're trying to preserve lighthouse history. And it's great that it's still going all these years. Thank you, Brian. Santo, you have anything to add? Just everyone stay safe out there. Thanks for everyone attending tonight and Merry Christmas and have a safe Thanksgiving. Thank you, Santa. Thank you so much. And to everybody, yeah, yeah. Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, Happy Hanukkah, Happy Thanksgiving. And <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much for your for being here and for your support. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm.